And we are going live now. It is gone. What is this? It's okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a series of uh, webinars we are hosted by KSIT Medical Academy uh, on intervention radiology. Today we'll be speaking. Uh, we have a guest speaker uh, speaking about breast interventions. How do I do it? Uh, over to Latika. Yeah, good afternoon and welcome to you all to the fifth episode of Nite University webinar series on interventional radiology. We are extremely happy and lucky, in fact, to be having with us today, Dr. Vidya Upadhyaya as one of our resource persons, as our resource person. She'll talk, give us a talk on breast intervention. As a dear friend and colleague, I could go on and on about Vidya, this multifaceted radiologist. But due to the paucity of time, I can go, I can only give a brief introduction of her. Dr. Vidya graduated from Gujarat University where she did her MBBS and MD, following which she did her FRCR in the UK and then sub-specialized in breast imaging. She later joined Shema and was associate professor here for a period of six years. She's a radiologist and a teacher par excellence. She was instrumental in setting up the breast unit here at Shema. She's currently working as a senior consultant radiologist at Senkang General University, Singapore, and has been working there for the past six years. She's also involved in teaching and organizing radiology workshops for medical students and radiology residents. She has a number of publications and presentations to her credit. Thank you, extremely, extremely thankful to you, Vidya, for accepting to be a part of our webinar series. And I'm sure you'll enthrall us for the next 45 minutes. Over to you, Vidya. Thank you so much, Latika, for your kind words. Can you all see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I have worked in Chema for uh, six years and I have very fond memories. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Raghu and uh, Latika and the organizers of this uh, webinar for inviting me here to share my experiences and learning. I'm really honored. Okay, so in the next um, 50 minutes, uh, we will look through the advantages of image, image guided procedures. Uh, I will talk about the common inter breast intervention procedures that I do using about 10 cases. Um, in, these include fine needle aspiration using ultrasound guidance, biopsy procedures, ultrasound and ST guided. Uh, we'll also look into some pre-procedure and post-procedure considerations. Um, tissue marker insertion, hook wire and non-wire localization for non-palpable lesions. And um, we will also touch upon some of the common challenges and complications of uh, breast intervention. Before I start, I would uh, like to talk a little bit about uh, my breast intervention journey. Uh, I was trained in all the uh, interventional procedures in breast test Wales in Clandidno in North Wales. And uh, there, uh, the nurses used to call me the queen of microcalcifications because I used to do the ST core biopsy uh, with great ease. Um, fast forward, I come to India, I retained some skills, but I lost some, uh, especially the ST re related skills because of non-availability of the machines. Then I moved to Singapore and there I see uh, routinely uh, procedures like STVAB uh, or, and even uh, core biopsy of the axillary nodes being done routinely. And some uh, these are uh, procedures that I'm, some of them I'm seeing for the first time. So retraining was a challenge for me. Uh, and I'm thankful for my um, colleagues and my boss for having supported me in this journey. And now I have gained sufficient experience to, talk, uh, to pass on these skills to my juniors. So why is this? Uh, doing these interventional procedures so important for us. Let's look at um, 
it from a patient's perspective and then from clinician's perspective. So this is a 42 year old female who came in for a screening mammogram. And you can see very faint microcalcifications, which I have um, outlined here for you. Uh, because it was a new cluster of calcifications, we were a bit worried. When we did ultrasound, we could uh, see a nodule at three o'clock, but we weren't very sure whether it really corresponded. And we could see a little tiny echogenic focus within, but still we decided to proceed with ST guided um, biopsy. And you can see the specimens containing calcifications. And then we went on to put a clip. So I'm just going to zoom. Uh, th so this is the calcification, and this is the clip post-procedure, uh, and you can see a little bit of hematoma and gas locules. Uh, it turned out to be a three millimeter DCIS, high grade, nu high nuclear grade ERPR positive. The patient uh, decided to uh, go for breast conserving surgery, so we put a clip in. So we put a hook wire through the clip that we had put in, and this is the surgical specimen with the clip, and these are the surgical clips. And uh, this year, she came for her surveillance uh, mammogram, post breast conserving surgery and post RT. From a clinician perspective, um, image detected lesions, which are not palpable, histology is now possible and uh, it's, it's image guided. And compared to surgical uh, biopsy, it's much faster, less invasive, more cost effective and it decreases the number of avoidable surgeries. So if the histology comes back as benign, we have avoided a surgery. If the histology comes back as malignant, we can plan the treatment better. We can uh, assess the risk, genetic assessment, breast MRI to determine if there is multifocal disease or exact extent of disease, especially in lobular cancer. We can do all that before treatment. Uh, if the uh, lesion is big enough, we can give neoadjuvant chemotherapy to reduce the uh, lesion size before they offer surgery. Even the type of surgery can be planned better, fewer operations to completion of surgery. Uh, if the axillary lymph node is positive, then we can avoid sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is time consuming and uh, less GA time for the patient. So the next question is what and how should we biopsy? According to ACR guidelines, all BIRADS 4 and 5 lesions should be offered biopsy. And ultrasound should always be the first line modality because it's easier for the patient and it's also easier and quicker for us. So if we see a lesion which has a height of more than 6 millimeter, it's safe to offer uh, ultrasound core needle biopsy, or this is what we normally tend to do in our institution. If the lesion is uh, uh, height is less than six millimeter or it's an intraductal lesion, then we offer ultrasound guided vacuum assisted biopsy. If there are microcalcifications or architectural distortion, we offer ST guided either vacuum assisted biopsy or core biopsy. In our institution, we do vacuum assisted biopsy. If the lesion is only detected on MRI and the second look ultrasound is negative, MRI guided biopsy um, needs to be offered. When we do FNA of a solid lesion, uh, we need to remember that the cellular yield can be very low. So if we get a negative result, um, just a second. If we get a negative result, Uh, it, it should not be accepted, um, especially if you have a very high suspicion of malignancy on imaging. Uh, for a cystic lesion, ultrasound F guided FNA is quite helpful. This is a 74 year old female who had an enlarging right axillary mass. You can see this mass on the mammogram um, and it was a, cl a clear uh, fluid containing lesion. Um, it was lymphangioma on uh, analysis and uh, it had increased triglycerides. Um, um, complex lesion, uh, which was an infected sebaceous cyst, we managed to aspirate 
we managed to give symptomatic relief to the patient and also got fluid for cultures and sensitivity. So it can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Before the procedure, we um, generally tend to take a written informed consent, especially for core biopsies and vacuum assisted biopsies. We explain all the benefits uh, and all the risks, including pneumothorax. Uh, although the risk of pneumothorax is very, very low. Uh, anticoagulation is a relative contraindication to all biopsies and uh, uh, should be discontinued for a short time prior to the biopsy. So in our institution, for uh, if the patient is on aspirin, we will continue, we will uh, proceed with ultrasound core biopsy of breast. But if um, it's ultrasound of the axilla, uh, sorry, if it's core biopsy of the axilla or vacuum assisted biopsies, then we tend to stop them for five days, uh, do the procedure uh, and um, uh, post procedure next day, if the patient is um, doesn't have any bleeding or any other symptoms, then um, we advise them to restart. Of course, this is uh, after discussion with the clinician uh, and they are involved uh, because we cannot really stop uh, anticoagulation in all the cases. This is the uh, preparation tray for our core and vacuum assisted biopsies. Uh, you can um, see the, this is the hexanol and uh, hexanol for skin cleaning and formaldehyde for uh, the specimen samples. For uh, local anesthesia, we tend to give lignocaine 1% and soda bicarb 1 ml. Uh, this is mainly to uh, take away the sting of the um, first prick. Uh, and for deeper anesthesia, which we normally use for vacuum assisted biopsy, 5 ml of lignocaine with epinephrine is used. So the epinephrine not only helps to prolong the anesthetic effect, but it also aids hemostasis. The needle sizes that we use for core biopsy is 14 gauge. For vacuum assisted biopsy, we use a bigger gauge, 12 gauge for ultrasound vacuum uh, biopsy and nine gauge for ST vacuum biopsy. Uh, a short video to show the ultrasound core biopsy. So we first plan the approach, clean the skin with hexanol, put a sterile towel on top, with ultrasound guidance, local anesthesia of 10 ml and 1 ml soda bicarb. We make a small nick in the skin with scalpel to minimize trauma to the skin. Then we introduce the gun. And you can see the lesion here and you can see the needle. When the biopsy gun is fired, a throw of 22 mm is expected and the inner cutting needle is fired first, immediately followed by the outer needle. The tissue is obtained in the trough, which is then put in the formalin bottle. We uh, apply pressure manual compression for 10, 10 minutes, achieve hemostasis, and dress with stereo strips and uh, steri strips and tegeta. So the, um, some of the essentials of vacuum assisted biopsy. The needle is actually uh, uses vacuum aspiration and rotating cutting needle and the tissue is collected in the basket and uh, the, almost the entire tissue lesion is disappears and then we put a tissue marker in to mark the site of the biopsy. After hemostasis is achieved, light compression mammogram uh, to document clip position. So on the screen, when we do the vacuum assisted biopsy, this is how the lesion uh, is seen. This is the lesion and you can see the trough of the uh, VAB needle. And uh, you can see how the lesion disappears. Um, so it's well, well documented by the sonographers. And then on, once the lesion has completely disappeared, we put a clip in uh, and then, but this is not very, very, uh, very clearly visible. So we always document with a uh, light compression mammogram. So a uh, little word about the metallic tissue marker. Uh, so as we just saw post biopsy and especially vacuum assisted biopsy 
and also core biopsy of very small lesions. Once, if you feel that the lesion will not be visible um, in a few weeks' time when the biopsy result is out, uh, you may want to put a clip in, a tissue marker in. So if the histology comes back as malignant, uh, then we, we can use this to guide our wire. Uh, but if the histology comes back as benign, then it stays in the breast forever. So it's a titanium metal, which hardly, uh, which is non-reactive. Uh, they are tiny and uh, they come in multiple shapes. This can also be useful in pre, pre new adjuvant cases where you expect the uh, cancer to shrink significantly in size post uh, uh, chemotherapy prior to surgery. So I, I uh, personally tend to like the uh, twirl, which is which has a very high ultrasound visibility. You can see that it's uh, seen very well in the uh, lesion here. There are also other uh, clips available in the market. So you can see this is, uh, they have a surrounding um, material, which is like a hydrogel, which absorbs water and swells up and is very, uh, very highly visible on ultrasound. But this visibility is only for maybe four weeks, six weeks, but it's enough for um, before the surgery is planned. There are a few other shapes. And these are useful because if you want to put multiple clips in a breast, um, you can use them uh, and uh, it later avoids confusion. So this is a case here where uh, there, were, there are a very uh, faint calcifications, which um, may not be very well projected here, but they are located here. And we, we did the biopsy and we put the clip in. So you can see the clip is nicely located on the uh, MLO projection in a very similar location, but on the CC projection, the clip has migrated uh, six centimeter. That's a bit unacceptable because it's quite far away. Up to two centimeter, we, um, we may not do anything, um, but if, if it's this far away, it's almost in, the, in, the, in a different quadrant. And it's a very known complication because when you read when you release the breast compression, uh, because of something called concertina effect, uh, the clip can migrate. And uh, we often, um, once we release, and if we realize that the clip has moved, then we uh, take the patient back into ultrasound. If we are able to identify the hematoma where the biopsy has been performed, we tend to put a clip in. Uh, but sometimes we just leave it, uh, depending on if we, if we don't have a high degree of suspicion, if we think that this may be benign, then we just leave it because, uh, we leave it for dealing with it at a later date. Uh, and then we, if necessary, we can hook, we can put a wire through this clip and then we identify certain, either there are some residual calcs or identify certain other uh, landmarks and can put a wire here as well. So these are some of the uh, things that we, we need to deal with as we go along. Post biopsy, uh, the small nick that we make on the skin, we, we, um, after achieving hemostasis, we put steri strips. We also put a, a gauze for the patient uh, at the site of the biopsy or the lesion itself. So in case there is bleeding or oozing from the skin wound, then the patient knows that she has to press on this wound, this uh, lesion area and uh, to achieve hemostasis. And then the, a tube dressing after to minimize hematoma. Uh, this was a young lady who had a cancer uh, or who had a suspicious looking uh, lesion at uh, right 12 o'clock position in a deep location. And this was the biopsy that we performed and it turned out to be uh, invasive ductal cancer. So she wanted to have a uh, breast conserving surgery and uh, we put a clip in. So after putting the clip, uh, when we did the mammogram, we couldn't really identify the clip. So we went in and put another clip and you can see the twirl nicely seated within the lesion. And this time when we did the mammogram, we could see the clip and we could see the clip on the MLO projection. And we also managed to catch the first clip that was inserted uh, in, the, in the first instance. So if we hadn't caught this, then I would have probably uh, had to proceed to do a chest x-ray or to really find out where the clip was because we hadn't really identified the first clip outside because sometimes the clip can fall off uh, when you pull out the needle. 
So, but thankfully we managed to see it there. And uh, what actually happened was uh, you, uh, we had the, uh, the core biopsy trajectory was a bit, you know, it had a longer length. So we, we, we uh, so I, I thought, uh, let me, let me take a shorter route and let me put the clip in directly. So I tried to go like this and uh, that decreased the visibility of my uh, needle and, um, uh, and the, what I thought was the tip of the needle was not really the tip. And I must have deployed it here thinking that the needle tip is here. So I managed, I probably deployed it. So that was a, really a learning for me that the needle trajectory always needs to be parallel to the chest wall. And uh, now I, I always go back to the original site of the biopsy site and just go in and um, deploy the clip. Um, because this is a very simple, small procedure, um, we cannot really take it lightly. And if, if you want to take anything from this talk, this is one learning that you must take that at all, cost, try and get the needle trajectory parallel to the chest wall. The visibility of the needle with ultrasound probe is better. You can see the entire needle and the tip and also the chances of pneumothorax or other complications uh, goes low. So a few other tips uh, for small lesions. Um, I normally, if I uh, really small lesions, once I identify the lesion with my left hand and I put the probe on the patient, I will get the nurse or somebody else to uh, give me the uh, needle syringe and change everything and I won't leave this because once I leave sometimes uh, it's difficult to identify especially with small lesions. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is when I infiltrate with spinal needle into smaller tissue planes the surrounding area gets very echogenic and the small nodule stands out uh, quite conspicuously so it's quite um, helpful to use spinal needle for uh, small lesions. When you have a superficial lesion uh, and you want to do a VAB, you can use uh, another needle to infiltrate uh, local anesthesia here so that you create like a plane. So when you do the vacuum assisted biopsy, you um, avoid skin laceration. Uh, for the deep lesion, as I already said, try and maintain the needle parallel to the chest wall. Uh, another case here where you can see microcalcifications in the nipple. And this patient had bloody nipple discharge. Um, and uh, on ultrasound, you can see uh, highly vascular nipple and you can see echogenic foci within the nipple. Uh, this turned out to be DCIS, um, but uh, nipple, just uh, this case I've just shown to say that uh, nipple areolar region, we, we normally don't touch because it's very, very uh, painful. Uh, and um, the surgeons usually do skin punch biopsy or they, they may, if there is a nodule, they may go in and do enucleation under GA or skin biopsy under uh, local anesthesia. But normally um, we, don't, we don't touch um, nipple areolar complex uh, lesions. For axillary lymph node, um, we normally have a cutoff of three millimeter in patients with breast cancer. So if they have an eccentric cortical thickening of three millimeter, we will offer biopsy. Uh, in a patient with no breast cancer, if the, if the cortical thickness is more than uh, four millimeter, then we may um, need to offer biopsy provided other features of um, abnormal lymph node is there. For example, uh, effacement of fatty hilum or round shape or ill-defined, or you know, there are other features which warrant biopsy. So this is just to talk, talking about the cortical thickness. And uh, in our department, we generally use Supercore, uh, or this is the needle that we use. It's got a very low complication rate. And if we are able to prove uh, metastatic involvement of the lymph node, then we are able to avoid uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy for the patient. So um, a little bit about the procedure. You can see the needle here. And you can see the trough, the uh, outer uh, needle and the trough within the lymph node. So when we actually reach the edge of the lymph node, we pull out the outer cannula and push forward the trough. And you hook the uh, lymph node and uh, you're ready to fire. There's no throw. So this is essential. This uh, technique is essential to avoid um, damage to the axillary vessels, which may be close by. 
moving on to stereotactic uh, biopsies and uh, procedure planning, we always need to remember to check the breast thickness before we go in and consent the patient. And uh, a breast thickness of less than two centimeter is usually uh, difficult to uh, do ST biopsy on. Uh, we, um, beforehand, you need to plan, uh, confirm the target, choose the most suspicious looking calcifications that you want to biopsy and decide the approach so that the radiographer can plan and uh, position the patient. And in general, we tend to use the shortest distance from the skin. So either we go uh, LM approach or ML approach or CC approach. Uh, in general, um, I prefer LM approach because it's easier for the patient. She can just move, away, move, move her head out of the way. ML approach is possible, but it, it's a bit more uh, cumbersome. CC approach is generally avoided. Um, we, we generally tend to avoid in our institution. The biopsy machines uh, are, uh, can be upright or prone. And in our department, we have an upright machine uh, where we have a detachable or attachable stereotactic biopsy device. And we can get very good posterior access with it. And the needle is slightly angled to get uh, good visibility of the uh, breast and the uh, target. Uh, the prone um, machines are uh, a dedicated machine for biopsy. So you have to dedicate a room and uh, that machine can just be used for biopsies. So it's not really economical for, uh, unless you have a very high volume center, but the, it's, uh, it, it uh, accounts for better patient experience and uh, they, they have a lesser vasovagal reaction. So a quick look at uh, ST biopsy procedure. So we select the target on two images taken in divergent planes. And the system with this triangulation is able to decide the depth, the Z axis of the lesion in the breast. Then the machine takes automated stereo images plus and minus 15 degrees. On the computer console, then we select the correct needle. The patient is positioned in sitting or lateral decubitus. We generally use only sitting. Then we take our first scout image. And if we are happy with uh, the target that we can see very clearly, then we take stereo pair images. We need to accurately select the target area in both the images, the same spec of microcalcification, and then we send it to the machine. We need to ensure that the target is green and the machine is al uh, allowing us to proceed with the biopsy. The radiographer then moves the uh, machine to the exact area. Then we clean the skin and move the needle on the, onto the skin surface. So we get the X and Y um, correct. We give LA and a small nick on the skin. Then we advance the target to the required Z position. As you can see, the zeros. And we take a pre-fire images to ensure that the target has not moved after local anesthesia. Trigger the green piston to move the needle to the exact area. We take a post-fire images. Then we are ready to start the biopsy and we take 12 samples in 360 degrees X-ray the specimen to see the calves. We are happy, then we take out the needle, leaving the butterfly in, and through the butterfly, the plastic cannula, we insert the clip. Then we take an image just to document the clip in the, before we release the compression of the patient. We re then release compression, apply manual pressure for 10 minutes, and then obtain standard MLO and CC views to document the position of the clip. So the total number of uh, images that we take in ST biopsy, the scout, the pre-fire where your needle has reached just the target. Post-fire when you press the, on the green piston, the needle is ready to start the biopsy. After clip deployment and standard uh, 
films after the procedure. Uh, in our institution, we have digital breast homosynthesis guided. Uh, we do our ST procedures with using DBT and it's much faster and we can cut down a few of these uh, steps or a few of these exposures. So when we get the sample, we need to ensure that we handle them gently because a distortion of the cells can uh, cause, um, it can interfere with the uh, pathologist interpretation. And we also need to remember that local anesthesia does not interfere with their uh, interpretation. So we can be generous with the local anesthesia when we do our biopsies. When we obtain the specimen, especially for microcalcification, we need to separate them. Once we obtain the specimen radiograph, we need to separate them into with and without calcifications. Why we need to do that? Uh, say, for example, the pathologist finds um, abnorm abnormal cells or ADH with, in a um, specimen with calcifications, in which case the surgeon may chase this, may want to excise the entire area and want to deal with it more proactively. If, say, for example, the same ADH was seen in the course without calcification, then she may not, it has been incidentally detected and not directly detected because we have not really, that ADH is not accounting for the uh, microcalcifications. So they may decide to not chase this any further if the microcalcifications are benign. So it helps them plan the management better. And um, so we normally generally always separate the course. We put them in two separate bottles. Um, vacuum assisted excision, VAE, uh, is the, it, it's, you, it's been with the newer guidelines, it, it's uh, used to replace the surgical diagnostic biopsy for high risk lesion. So once we do the biopsy and we get high risk lesion, we just go in again and with a bigger needle and we take it out. So the patient has saved a surgery. Uh, under local anesthesia, we get a bigger amount of tissue and use larger needles. We have not, uh, we don't do it in our institution yet, but it is getting very popular. Uh, maybe I can give you guys one minute to, um, for a stretch break. Okay, we move to the next segment of uh, looking at some challenging scenarios. Uh, I have used one case and uh, to show a few teaching learning points. Okay, so just a quick reminder again, um, a breast thickness of 16 millimeter or less than two centimeter, we may not be able to offer ST biopsy, uh, but you may offer a hook wire localization for those kind of lesions. Okay, so this is the nodule which was picked up on the uh, mammogram because of the asymmetry. And this is the lesion that was seen on, in the right breast on ultrasound. You can see the needle trajectory is parallel to the chest, chest wall. And um, a useful tip is uh, if you allow yourself to go a bit further and you get your plane right for the uh, uh, lesion, um, you are more likely um, to get a good um, plane. So if you if you try and go like this, then you may you may not have enough room to maneuver to get your plane right. Um, always good to document the needle trajectory in two planes. So we, this is the longitudinal plane, and this is the uh, transverse plane for the needle in the lesion. And this is helpful, particularly when we sit in the MDTs and uh, the pathologist or the um, surgeon may question, have you really got the got into the lesion? Because if they are really small, then we need to document uh, uh, Normally the throw of the needle is 2.2 centimeter. And you can see here that it's quite close to the chest wall. 
So you, some of the uh, needles will allow a smaller throw, so 18 millimeter throw, which is much safer. Um, also, another point to remember is air can obscure your visibility, especially when you're dealing with small lesions. And so uh, we need, when we inject our local anesthesia, we need to ensure that there is no air molecules in our syringe. Okay, so this is a 30 year old female with a palpable lump. And you can see a solid stick lesion here. So we did an FNA, aspirated the fluid first, and then we did a, a core biopsy of the lesion. The final histology was fibroadenoma, but in large uh, lesions where there's a big cystic component, again, um, this may help with the uh, aspiration of the cystic component may help with um, minimizing the spread of tissues into the surrounding, um, minimize uh, uh, abnormal cells into the surrounding tissue. In uh, stereotactic biopsy, when you have a superficial lesion, uh, the trough may be uh, partly in and partly out. Uh, if that happens, the vacuum seal is not very good and the biopsy may not be, we may not be able to get your target. So the entire sampling chamber should be within the breast. So one uh, possibility is we push the needle in further. So instead of having the target at the center of the trough, you can have the target at the back end of the trough and you will still get your target. Or you can use a smaller petite aperture sleeve and you can get the target. Or you can use, um, you can create an anesthetic wheel and kind of create uh, artificial thickening of the skin here and you may be able to get away using this standard needle as well. This lady we wanted to biopsy. You can see microcalcifications here that we wanted to offer biopsy. Uh, but when we did the DBT uh, for her for on the day of the biopsy, um, we saw these calcifications on the first few slices, not the topmost, but maybe the second, third slice. And uh, we raised the possibility that could these be dermal calcifications? So we, when we saw and uh, inspected the patient, she had two sebaceous cysts in that area. So we went ahead and we put uh, body markers on the sebaceous cyst. So you can see the first, uh, first time we put two of these body markers and we tried to see if they, and then we obtained uh, tangential views of these to see if they are really dermal. But we realized that we are not able to identify exactly. So we put another dermal marker. So two different shapes and you can still see the calcifications. You can see the calcification here and you can see the calcifications here with the second one. So we managed to prove that it is dermal calcification and we could abandon the procedure. But if there is, if you do not find any skin lesion, then what, then, and you suspect that it could be uh, dermal, the location of the calcification may be dermal if it is in the first few slices, then what you can do is you can target, using the machine, you can target as per normal and um, you, you can um, use the needle um, to go, uh, to to touch the skin, so the body marker, and then put the body, body marker on the skin. So now you have got the X and Y coordinate, and you can take, you can put the body marker there, and you can take these um, tangential films and prove that uh, they are dermal calcifications. If we uh, accidentally uh, proceed with uh, biopsy of these dermal calcifications, we can cause skin laceration. Um, also, the machine may or may not allow you to proceed with the biopsy because. Um, very deep lesions or very superficial lesions, the machine may not allow. Very thin breast is also a challenge. Um, and uh, what the radiographers can do is they can roll the breast in such a way that within the paddle, you can create an extra skin bulge. So you kind of artificially inflate the breast thickness for the machine and for the needle to allow you to position. Or you can use uh, the mammo pad or uh, you know saline bag or something extra uh, to put in the breast at, at the other side between the plate and the breast to artificially create, um, uh, to allow the machine to allow you to target the lesion. 
but usually most of the times rolling the breast in certain way uh, helps to achieve um, success in the sampling. We play an active role in the multidisciplinary meets for imaging pathology correlation. Um, the high risk lesion uh, are not only a challenge for us, but also for the pathologist. Um, and uh, as a team, we can decide whether we not need to re-biopsy, whether we, can, we need to surgically excise it or any other kind of intervention is needed. Sometimes in these uh, meetings, we uh, realize that the, the calcifications that we have identified uh, is not, um, so normally the, uh, the, the pathologist is not able to identify. So normally they will use polarized light to help them identify the calcifications. But if for some reason, especially if the, if the calcifications are very faint or if the calcifications are related to FCC, then uh, they may not be able to, then it may dissolve when they do all their slicing of the specimens. Uh, so if they've created their paraffin uh, blocks, then we can just x-ray them and point out to the area of calcification so they can go in and have a look. So, um, so we've looked at uh, some of the challenging scenarios. We've looked at thin breast, superficial location, deep location, close to blood vessels or in a breast with implant. So in these cases, you may use... Um, um, local anesthesia to lift away the blood vessels so you can proceed with biopsy or uh, you just need to be uh, parallel to the implant shell so you can uh, do the biopsy. Uh, and always remember that if you can't access these uh, location lesions, then you may be able to offer hook wire localization for excision. We also looked at um, clip migration and discordant radiology pathology reports which is usually solved with teamwork. So moving on to the next segment of uh, localization techniques that we can use for non-palpable lesion. The easiest is you identify the lesion on ultrasound and you can just skin mark, give them the depth of the lesion, the size of the lesion. The surgeon will be able to go in and uh, take out the lesion. Uh, if you want to be a bit more accurate, you can do hook wire localization. You can use either ultrasound or ST, depending on how the lesion is visible. If the lesion is visible on ultrasound, we always prefer ultrasound localization. You can see the wire, and this is the outer cannula. So you, uh, when the patient requires wide local excision, if the, rest, if the lesion is still, uh, you can still identify the lesion, or if there is no lesion, if there's a clip in place, we put a wire through this clip so that uh, the surgeon can go in and uh, excise the lesion. Sometimes we uh, bracket the lesion. For example, this case where uh, you can see a very small, tiny lesion, which was a DCIS, biopsy to one DCIS. The surgeon wanted to be absolutely certain that because this was non-palpable, she wanted to be certain that she wants to get this out. She asked us to put two wires uh, to mark the extent. And you can see the two wires and uh, this is the bracketing of the uh, lesion. Even in multifocal disease, or if the lady wants to do two um, wide local excision, if they're in different quadrants, we can put uh, two separate wires for this. So these are all usually done in discussion with the surgeon as they want, we try and help out. Um, ST hook wire localization, a quick look at the procedure. So we uh, get the wire and the two needle guides ready along with local anesthesia. Take the stereo pair images, select our target and send the coordinates to the machine. Insert the two needle guides, clean the skin and drape. Then we insert the puncture cannula in the needle holder. I usually take out the wire, I just put the puncture needle go 10 millimeter beyond the target and then thread the wire through the cannula and deploy. Once we have deployed, then we take stereo pair images to make sure we are happy with the position. And once we are happy, then we slowly release compression. We secure the wire well with the BB marker, apply a mild compression to achieve homeostasis. Then we do a light compression mammogram to document the wire. 
So these are usually taken as, out as hard copy films with the patient, sent with the patient for the surgeon to look at it when they operate. There's some disadvantages with this because uh, you need to do this on the day of the surgery. Uh, the patient movement and the arm movement is restricted uh, in between this procedure and the surgery. The wire may slip out in between this time. Uh, and so the wireless localization is now becoming popular. Um, there's this radioactive seed, which you can insert five days prior, five days prior to the procedure. Uh, or even better, this electromagnetic wave reflector device, which is uh, which we have started using recently, um, which is uh, under the name of Savvy Scout, which you can insert <clears throat> 30 days prior. Um, yes, all, all of these cause better, um, have better patient experience, but the cost uh, may be a bit more. So this is the um, Savvy Scout. So you can see it has two antennas and an infrared um, receptor. And this is how it looks when it's deployed. This is the handheld detector, which the surgeon uses in the theater to identify it. It makes a beep sound, um, just like the gamma camera for uh, radionuclide. Um, and then uh, you can see the wire, uh, the clip is out with the surgical specimen. One thing we need to remember is hematoma, blood products and calcification can interfere with the signal detection. So if there is a post biopsy hematoma, then we need to put this clip on top. So when the surgeon uses the handheld detector, they, they are able to identify this um, clip. This was a case that we were looking at uh, recently and we found this uh, hook at the very edge of the film. So we went back to the old films and we realized we have put in uh, two wires for this patient using ultrasound guidance. And the actual operative specimen, one of the wire was intact. The second wire had been yanked and you can, you can imagine that the su surgeon might have had trouble pulling this out. And actually, if you measure the length of the wire, uh, this um, we, I realize now that um, the wire is, so this is about 10 millimeter, this is 20 millimeter. So we reala realize that uh, this is uh, short and neither the surgeons nor we realized it. And um, this retained hook wire um, is, is a complication basically, because had we realized it at the time of the surgery, the surgeon can quickly take it out. So when we ask the vendor whether it can be left behind, because the material is similar to the surgical clips, um, they, they would not give an uh, answer. And uh, so it was, uh, the surgeon was going to have an open discussion with the uh, patient. And I'm not entirely aware what happened. What did she decide after? So just uh, a, a reminder that we need to look at the operative specimens also carefully. Um, this is a 72-year-old female who had ST uh, vacuum-assisted biopsy for calcifications, which you can see here. And this is the post-hematoma, post-biopsy, and this is a little clip. She was on warfarin, and uh, that was restarted the next day, and the histology was benign. But on day seven, there was a sudden increase in breast size, and she landed in our a &E. This was done in another hospital, and then she landed in our a &E and with a sudden increase in size, severe pain. She also had an episode of um, collapse. And we tried and aspirated uh, one liter of uh, old blood, and after which she became a bit uh, hypotensive. And then finally, she had to be moved to surgery for uh, evacuation. So this aspiration was um, done mainly to relieve her uh, pain because she was in so much pain, morphine infusion and everything. But uh, one thing which we realize now is we need to accept cases very carefully, uh, treat uh, breast hematoma on breast as a third space drainage because the moment you aspirate, if there is an active leak going on, they will, it will continuously fill up and the patient may become hypotensive because of that. Um, you need to have a reversal of anticoagulation on board, whether it's FFP or vitamin K and you need to um, have that in board, otherwise there's no point in aspirating. So the surgeon has to be on board and you need to do this with the surgeon. Otherwise, uh, better not touch these kind of cases and let the surgery, so the surgeon take the patient directly to theater. 
or even the IR, because uh, they can have pseudo aneurysms which the, which the IR can embolize. Uh, last case, um, this is a lactating female uh, who had a solid uh, lump in the breast. And uh, we need to remember that in a lactating patient, there's a low but definite risk of milk, milk fistula formation if we do a core biopsy. But this was a solid lump. And we also need to remember that uh, if there is a solid lesion in the uh, pregnancy and lactating um, period, the cancer can be really aggressive. So we, need, we may need to do biopsy, but we need to be careful. So this one, because it was a solid lesion, we, when they attempted um, aspiration, there was no aspirate. But when, but when they did the core biopsy, then the cyst completely collapsed and um, milk or milkish kind of material came out. So this was actually a galactosine. But we need to remember to include it in the consent taking. And uh, usually it settles. Um, but we have, uh, but occasionally uh, there are reports that bromocryptine has to be used to stop the milk production. Thankfully, we've done a few of these, but thankfully none of, uh, so there's been, there's been a bit of milk ooze for a couple of days, but um, there, there has been no long-term problem. So in conclusion, I would like to say that image-guided biopsies are very accurate and uh, acceptable alternative to surgical biopsy. It's an outpatient procedure which can be done under local anesthesia, is readily available, and is less invasive with very low risks. And uh, as we just now saw, biopsies can be successfully performed despite challenging scenarios. And it not only improves patient experience and outcome, but it also enhances our role in the patient management. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm open. Any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. That was an excellent presentation. You explained everything so well with the videos and images. I think the PGs have benefited a lot with this. I hope so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Sure. Thank you. It was very interesting talk. Uh, there are no questions, ma'am. Doubts. Everything was so clear, ma'am. You explained very well. Thank you for your time and efforts. Okay, sure. Yes, no questions. No, no questions? questions? Yeah, no questions. <laughs> so either, either um, everybody's uh, fallen asleep or uh, everybody's. Oh, no, ma'am. No, <laughs> I think they'll watch it later, ma'am. It's live uh, this thing also. So they'll watch later on YouTube. But very interesting topic. You made everything so clear. Very interesting, ma'am. The cases were all very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no questions, ma'am. We'll just end. So uh, I thank you. Uh, one second. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. And it was a very wonderful talk. And uh, I know with under the stress also, you have uh, taken up this task of doing a webinar. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Once again. Welcome, Raghu. It was my pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, Vidya. It was a lovely talk. Thank you. Thanks, Latika. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So can I, huh? Any any other questions? Anything? Nothing? Then oh, no, no, no. Yes, ma'am. No questions. Okay. They'll watch it later, ma'am. Most of them. This is their class. Yeah, if anybody has any yeah. questions or anything, you can direct them to sure, me. Ma we'll just forward it to you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all the people who have logged in for the session. And uh, the postgraduates and Dr. Raghurat sir and all the faculty for helping in organizing this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you once again, Vidya ma'am. It was very nice to hear your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, ma'am. Bye. Have a nice day, ma'am.